What's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. We are going to take a little trip up north on this episode to Connecticut. Got a great guest on for y'all. We're going to talk about uh, a lot about TOG, Tall TOG, uh, and we were just having the conversation pre-show about you know how so many different fish have different names, different places, they call them different things. So I think they call it black fishing up there some too. Um, but but tog fishing as well as striper fishing and some some shark fishing in here too. So if any of that interests you, um, check this episode out for sure. It's going to be a great one. Before we get too deep into it, before I introduce our guest, uh, I'm going to just give you all a little bit of uh, the pre-show stuff. So go check out our Patreon account if you want some extra content as far as um, Eastern Current goes. We I, what I'm doing right now is preloading the podcast episodes on there before they go live so you can check them out beforehand if you want to want to get uh you know get a few few more episodes in uh sometimes there might just be one one episode you know i'm just i'm starting to do that today uh sometimes there'll just be one episode other times there might be up to 10 12 episodes that haven't actually been shared yet so it's a great way for you to you know find a few more podcasts to listen to also i'm breaking down every guide trip that i'm doing with like a three to ten minute you know diagnosis of what tackle was working what the conditions were like um, and, and kind of showing y'all what I found to be productive that day on the water here in North Carolina. So if that interests you or if you just want to support the podcast because you like listen to it, go check out the Patreon account. The other thing is go check out Eastern Current Fishing on Facebook. It's a private Facebook group for all of our listeners to just communicate with each other uh, and, and, you know, kind of collectively, you know, become better anglers together. So that's enough of me rambling. I'm already struggling with my words. So I'm going to go ahead and bring our guest on, Mike. What's going on, man? Well, how much, man? How you doing? Doing good, doing good. I told Mike, I was like, "Hey, let's let's record at three thirty, and it's four forty seven right now." So he's been very patient with me. Um, I've recorded. This is the second one today, and and the other one went over a little bit. But I apologize for that, man. Super excited to have you on, and I'm ready to pick your brain. With I did a podcast with your buddies at the Outdoor Drive the other day, and I was talking about how I was I, I, this past fall. I really got into targeting a tog and. They're like, what's a big tog down there? And I was like, oh, six pounds, seven pounds. And they were just laughing me. Yeah, I should have just ended the Skype call right then. They were laughing at me like, that's a, that's a tiny fish. So I'm excited to kind of hear about, you know, how y'all target these fish and, and kind of hear. I just, I like learning from different anglers from different areas. Because, you know, as soon as you kind of just, you know, settle into what you've been doing, that's when you kind of stop growing as an angler and your right. your ability kind of slows down a little bit. But um First off, kind of give people your backstory. Tell us where you're from. You know, tell us how you got into fishing and how it's brought you to where you are today. So, um, I, I'm from Eastern Connecticut. Um, I live in East Lyme now. I've lived within a half hour or so of the water my whole life. Um, I started fishing very young age. You know, three years old. Um, when I was 12, I started going on one of the local party boats like pretty much every weekend in the summer and mm -hmm. uh basically they started training me how to do it professionally yeah. so from the time i was 12 to 15 um i spent all my spare time learning how to be a deckhand and a captain and uh once i turned 16 i started you know getting paid to do it and started working all the boats and, you know i i have my foot in a lot of different doors and i'm kind of <laughs> we can, I say, we say I'm the whore of the fleet. I jump around from boat to boat to boat every single day. Some days I'm on two different boats working different trips. Wow. And, uh, it's fun for me because it's not the same repetitive fishing every single day. Definitely. You know, I like to, I like to see, you know, like you said, you like to learn other people's perspectives from different areas. And, you know, every captain does things differently. Every deck and every boat, every operations run differently and they fish for different species, different ways. And I get to experience a lot of it from a lot of different perspectives. Yeah. And it, it works out great for me. But yeah, that's huge, man. I think that's – if you want to grow as an angler, you know, immerse yourself in a lot of different types of fishing culture, a lot of different anglers, people that are fly fishing, people that are, you know, bait fishing, people that are like tackle fishing. Like just learn it all because it's all going to really come together. It's all fishing. It's all tricking this fish into eating something that's on the end of your line is really what you break Absolutely. it down to. to. So – um, I think that's huge, man. I, I, I applaud you for, for hustling and, and working on different boats like that. And so explain to people. So there's a lot of head, is it kind of head boat fishing that y'all are doing up there with like multiple people on, on one boat or how does that work out? So we have primarily up here, we have like Eastern Connecticut itself has 
four major head boats. There's you know a couple smaller ones, um, and then there's a lot of private charters where gotcha. most of them are six pack boats. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a there's a couple of smaller inspected vessels. Like one of the boats I work on a lot, we take up to fifteen people. Okay, um, but it, it's primarily the head boats and six pack charters. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. So the the you're saying the majority of the boats you're working on are are the larger vessels or the or a mixture of the two? <laughs> a mixture of all gotcha. of them, actually. <laughs> gotcha, it's, gotcha. I I'm basically full time on one head boat. I'm on another one that we do 15, and I'm on a six pack all the time. Nice. Those are my three primary boats. Cool. That's There's a cool. I do fill in on other boats and stuff. But that's so I really get all of it. <laughs> right on. Yeah, that that's super cool. Um, it's it's funny how it's like no, no matter where you are, what fish. You're, I don't know why I'm clicking this pen. People can probably hear it on the podcast. I'm always fidgeting with something, but um, no matter where you are, there's always you know it seems like the grass is greener somewhere else. But um, I, I always look at you know either excuse me north and south and seem like man the the striper fishing up there is really cool and you know north of North Carolina and, and Virginia. But I look down south, I'm like wow, I wish we had permit and bonefish here and so it's really just, man, it, it, wherever you are, you just got to find find how you can be happy with where you are and learn how to become a better angler where you are. It's going to make you a better angler across the board. But um, well, let's dive into um, kind of let's talk about what you look for when you're going tog fishing. Like what kind of bottom do you want? What kind of depth do you want up there? Um, take us through just, you know, trying to find an area to, to catch tog first. So basically our tog fishery up here and, and – Eastern Long Island um, has some of the best structure for black fishing around. Um, you basically, you want the nastiest, ragged, rocky, jagged bottom you can find. Wow. Um, you know, we have, we're fortunate. That's one thing that I do like about our end of the sound and the sound in general is we have that crazy amounts of structure. Um, you want, I mean, wrecks you know any wrecks you can find any reefs just any any yeah. of those rock piles are going to hold blackfish gotcha. some of them hold more than others some of them hold more bigger fish some hold tons of smaller fish um you know as you develop obviously that's where you start to hone in on the really good spots but i mean it's you just want the nastiest bottom you can find if you're not losing your sinkers and rigs constantly you're probably not in the right spot yeah so when you say there's a lot of structure up there, is it like, you know, if at any given moment you look at your, you know, your graph, are you seeing good bottom? Like, is it all rocky bottom and ledgy stuff? Or is it like Not, a lot of flat sand and you're looking for those piles of, of structure? It, it can be a bit of both. Okay. Um, we have some big reefs. Um, you know, there's spots like there's Bartlett's Reef, there's the race, which is the mouth of the sound where it dumps into the ocean. Um there's lots of big pieces of bottom and then there's small pieces where it's just like that. There's, you know, sand everywhere with like a random rock pile in the middle of it. And those are the spots that usually get overlooked, yeah. you know, like the big pieces of the bottom, those are the spots that everybody knows and goes to and they can absolutely produce. Yeah. Um, my biggest blackfish ever came from a spot like that. Yeah. But you know, a lot of the big groups of bigger fish that I found, seem to come from those smaller pieces that everybody overlooks. Yeah. People don't even realize they're there. I mean, we, I have, I fished one spot quite a bit that it's shallow water. It's like 13 feet of water and it's nothing but sand everywhere. And there's just one little rock cluster in it. And every time we fish it, I've seen 10 to 14 pound fish come out of it. Wow. That's crazy. And it's, I don't know what it is. You know, we don't hammer on it. It's just one of those spots that we hit once in a while and it always holds a big fish. That's cool. But, that that kind of plays true down here for us too, man. Is like the the smaller stuff is where you're going to go have your good and, and the tog. It's like I I don't catch enough of them down here to be like this is what you need to fish. I, I like catching them. What I, I usually catch them when I'm trying to sheep's head fish, um, you know, in the ocean. I, I don't, I've never caught one in shore. I've caught them on the jetty. I used to spear them on our jetty when I was in, a kid and in like high school and college. I'd go out there to spear sheep's head and I'd see them sitting in the rocks. Um, but the, I, the, when I started to realize, oh, I can actually catch these things is when I was, I started sheepshead fishing in the ocean with crabs, mud crabs and whatnot and catching them. Um, 
But yeah, for, for us, it's like with the flounder and any of those near shore fish, the little stuff, the little live bottom edges, the slight changes, that's where your quality fish usually are. And like you yeah. said, I mean, if, if there wasn't a hundred boats going out every day, that the big stuff would probably be absolutely loaded too. I think it really oh. is just a matter of, you know, pressure. So absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, well, cool. So when you're, when you're, you know, say you find a spot or you, now, you know, you're all the spots you want to fish. Like what's your setup? Take us through like your rod reel and then kind of how you're rigging and what kind of bait you're fishing. So, um, I, typically what I have is I'll have, a, a heavier conventional rod. Okay. You want something with a lot of backbone, but a soft enough tip so you can feel those little bites. And, you know, I know black fishing kind of varies. I'm sure it's a lot different down for you guys, mm -hmm. but around here, like you're primarily using green crabs for bait or in the shallower water you can get away with these crabs that we have that are called asian invader crabs yeah yeah and um those work really well in shallow water okay. um but anything like i'd say like 15 feet and up you want the green crabs um you can use hermit crabs too if you can get your hands on them but you pretty much you get one shot at a set the hook on a fish you know you feel tick tick and if you don't swing on the boom forget it your bait's gone so you got to have something that you can feel that bite, but you got to also get them up out of the structure as fast as you can. You know, you hook a big fish and it starts peeling a ton of line and you can't stop it. It's going to bust you off nine times out of 10. Yeah. Are they pretty spunky fish? Those larger ones? Are they kind of, you know, they'll dog you and try to get back into the structure pretty quick. Absolutely. Cool. Um, they, the big ones that I've seen, for the most part, they they will take off like a like hooking a giant bluefin almost. Yeah, and cool. if they, if they don't find their way into a hole, <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna end up dragging you across some kind of structure along the line. Yeah, and it's just I've seen so many big fish bust off, and it's it is heartbreaking for sure, especially in the in the <laughs> chartering business of like you know you're working hard to get that client a, a solid fish and. They, mm -hmm. they hook it and the people don't realize like when you're fishing around structure like that when you say like put the wood to them and get them out of that dock or get them out of that structure like they're like oh yeah all right and then, and then it happens yeah. I'm like, i told you you have to lock it down and winch yeah, absolutely on them. absolutely um, it's no different here do you have a specific conventional reel that you prefer when you are talk fishing um i have a Daiwa 20h that i use okay. um that's one of my favorites um I mean, I, I use just about everything. I have yeah. Avids. I don't really care for them that much anymore. Um, uh, Shimano's. I mean, pretty much anything with a good smooth drag yeah. is something I prefer. If you have a drag that just skips the whole time, it's, you know. That's not fun not, for anybody. Not that it, <laughs> no, not that it's not going to work, but it's not my preferred method. Right, you know? right, right. I'd rather spend the money and, you know, try to have every advantage I can. Yeah, I have a buddy that hooked a sailfish two days ago, and he had, he had his dad's old Shimano. Um, he was I think it was about twenty miles off, or I think they were Shimano dad's older reels, and it was a big sailfish. And they like all of a sudden they were inshore for us here, and, and people are catching them inside of the Gulf Stream. And he had hadn't hooked anything decent on it, you know, just some small mahi, and it was just he said it was like meow, meow, and just all of a sudden it ripped off, it loosened up, and back backlash real bad on the spool and broke him off. And oh yeah, so jumpy drag, I don't care what it is, it's no fun to fish with. And Absolutely. I, I had a buddy on the boat the other day, and we were we were speckled trout fishing. Just speaking of gear not working well, it was a Shimano Stratic uh, spinning reel. And I almost had to throw his freaking rod off the boat because it was whenever he would reel, his roller bearing was messed up in that thing, and it was just the whole. And I'm like, dude, you gotta fish one of my rods. That is the most annoying noise. You're you're taking so much away from the stage for me. Yeah, absolutely. But um, all right. So rod wise, you said like a heavier. Are you talking like a medium heavy, medium fast type of rod? And seven yeah. foot, eight foot. Yeah, I I prefer like a seven foot or a six okay. six. Okay. Um, probably six six. Cool. more preferred for me um i like something with a good size foregrip um i think that's more personal preference than anything yeah um but like i said you you want that stiff that stiff backbone that's a big thing and then you know that's our conventional setups um a lot of a lot of people have gotten into you know the past five five six years i guess or so 
um, jig fishing for blackfish. Really? Um, actually, I have a jig here. Um, this guy right here, it's called an as asylum jig. Hold it just a, t a tad higher sure. on the screen. Okay, asylum jig, you said? Yep. Um, a buddy of mine actually makes them here in Connecticut. His daughter makes them. Um, and they work really well. There's a ton of different jig companies around here that make jigs and stuff. There's a ton of different varieties. Um, like you can see with this jig, how it sits upright like that. Mm -hmm. And that's my preferred type of jig sits up like that. There's other ones that lay flat, which basically like, like a lima bean shaped jig or something okay. where the hook lays like that. And they work, but I like to have my hook upright. So my crab's sitting up more. Um, I feel like you get a lot more better hook sets with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you'd think the way a tog's mouth is shaped, like with that hook laying sideways on the ground or on the bottom, when he goes to eat it, it would be much harder to get that hook spun into his the corner it's, of his mouth than if exactly. it's exactly yeah. That and that that's my exact thought process with it. So that's sure. why I like using those jigs, and that that would be where your rod and reel would be different than a heavier conventional. Okay. So for for jigging, I prefer a spinning rod. Um. I have a, I think it's a six foot three Shimano Travala. Okay. Um, and I have a Travala S. Those are my favorite jigging rods. Um, and again, just you want a good reel. Um, I mean, the, the ones that I have right now, I have Quantum Bocas on. Yeah. They're not the best. I, I love them, other than I have some problems with the anti backlash on them. Gotcha. But, um, it's you, something like those Travalas and the Travala S's, you get that same sort of thing where it's got the backbone to move a fish when you need it to. And it's also got that soft tip where you can really feel those light bites. Yeah. And every day in every rock pile, they bite differently. Sometimes they'll chew their faces off and you can't miss them. Some days you're going to miss a lot of fish. Yeah. And if you don't have the right rod, forget it. Yeah. Is there much bycatch when you're fishing tog up there, like or trash fish bycatch that's gonna steal your bait? You get, um, we get some. Sometimes you'll get porgies, you'll get some sea bass. Um, are you? Are they? Would it be a jolt head porgy? Is that what it is? Up there? No, ours are. They're they're similar looking. Okay. Don't have the biggest head like them. Um, ours are just. I think they're northern porgies. Northern porgies. Okay. Scup, they call them up here. A lot of Scup, guys call yeah, them. Yeah, for that term. Um, you get porgies, you get some cunners, or that's another one of those fish like you were saying before. Different names, you know, New Jersey. I think there a lot of places they call them burgals. They call them uh, ocean perch. Okay. Um, we call them cunners. Um, you get some of them mixed in. Um, the past few years we've been getting more and more trigger fish. Oh, cool. Um, all the ones we get up here are great triggers. I've heard, I have heard of one queen trigger fish caught up here. Um, and occasionally you never know, you might get a sea bass or a, right. a striper or bluefish. And I've even seen a bonita eat a, eat a crab. Really? <laughs> um, which the last thing I ever expected to see. Yeah, that is <laughs> funny. It, it happened. <laughs> I had a buddy catch a, a bonito on a bottom super jig, which I guess is kind of like those jigs that you've got there. Um, he he was I think he was sheephead fishing, but he got his bait stolen and was reeling it up real fast, and yeah. had no clue there were bonita around. Hooked a bonito on the jig coming up, and then like threw metal for like the next hour and called bonita. So yeah. that's pretty funny. Those bonita like if they're fired up, they'll if something's moving quickly, they're probably gonna eat it. Absolutely. Um, well, take me through. Well, oh here's one more one more question about your rig. I wanted to ask: Are you fishing mono fluoro braid as far as your main line goes on those those reels? Main line, it always braid. Always braid. Uh, cool. You will, you will never see me blackfish without braid gotcha. again, ever. That that tension, or you just have such good connection with braid, you can feel everything. absolutely. Uh, what absolutely? What size braid do you like to fish? Uh, I typically I'll fish thirty to fifty pound. Thirty to fifty. Um, cool. You know, anything heavier, you get a lot more resistance in the water, so you end up having to use more lead to hold bottom. Gotcha. Um, anything lighter, you know, you hook a good one, you're going to pop them off. Yeah. Um, if you are fishing those jigs, are you fishing any type of leader or are you going straight to braid? No. Uh, 
Um, I always use some sort of shock leader. Okay. Um, I usually, I prefer to use heavier mono for my shock leader. Um, I usually use 80. Okay. That's, it's more so for the abrasion. You're going to, you're going to be chafing your leader. You're going to be hooking rocks. You're going to be dragging bottom. And when you hook a good fish, the last thing you want to do is chafe, chafe with them off, right. especially if they swim into a rock and you're, you know, I, I've had fish swim into rocks and I've stuck my rod older and when that launched an hour later, I reeled an eight pound fish up and finally came out of the hole, you know, so you, you want something that you can depend on. Yeah. Um, I know, I know guys that are like, oh, 20 pounds fine, 30 pounds fine. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it'll work, but you're going to bust off a lot more fish. For sure. Yeah. 20 pound is, it sounds like a heavy, heavy uh, line, but it's, man, the amount of fish I've broken off on 20 pounds, like on the hook set, especially fly fishing, and I, and you, you'll strip set in salt water. So your rod tips straight at the fish and you strip back, and that fish just turns his head the other way for a split second while you're still holding it, and you, you'll pop 20 like it's nothing. Absolutely. And, and it's such a thin diameter that like a, just a little nick from a rock and you know, you lose so much of that line. So, um, yeah, I would, I, I'm always, I like to fish as light as I feel I can get away with, but it, when I'm around structure like that, like I like to fish as heavy as I can get away with. So exactly. I'm the same way, man. You don't, I don't, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you want to catch that big one, then you, you better, yep. you better bring the right stuff. Um, so what, what is your personal best talk? I'm curious. Cause the biggest one I've ever caught, I think is probably like six and a half pounds down here. And I know you're about to crush that with <laughs> what you're going to say. I, 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 I got one that, that, that crushes that. <laughs> I got one, uh, two seasons ago was 16.25. Golly, that's nuts. And, uh, it was pretty, it's pretty cool. I was in a tournament too. So I wiped the tournament with that. <laughs> I bet. What was second place fish in the tournament? Um, second, so the second place fish happened to be my best friend and it was 12.55. Wow. Were y'all fishing together that day? No, uh, it was actually, it was a month long tournament oh, and sweet. Uh, it was pretty cool. It was the first time they did it. It was a month long tournament and they had different categories. Like you had the best for the week, um, the best for each way station. There was four bait shops you could weigh in at. And then there was the, the biggest fish, second, third, and then yeah. there was the top, top two. Sweet. So you got to weigh in your top two for the total week. And uh, I actually, I mopped up every category in first place, and he mopped up every category in second place. Nice. And he he put in a lot of effort to beat me, and I, I just got lucky. Yeah. I'll be honest. And I, I just got lucky and got the right fish. And still this day is a little bit buttered. <laughs> That's awesome. Did it come from a place where you're like, this is where I need to be to catch this fish? Or were you just hitting a bunch of different piles of, of rocks and structure? And That particular day, it was one of those big pieces of bottom that everybody knows about. Wow. And we were catching a lot of smaller fish. Um, I was in my buddy's boat. You know, he's, it, it just it was one of those things where we were, ca we were catching a lot of fish. So we're like, screw it. Why bother leaving? And I, we ended up trying to leave and the anchor was stuck and it was stuck, stuck. It wasn't coming out. So I ended up choking up the anchor line and found even more killer bottom when I was moving up the boat, trying to pull the anchor. And when we couldn't get it up, we said, screw it. Let's just fish right here on this little piece since we were farther up from, you know, we're about 50 yards ahead. And, uh, I ended up hooking one fish that I, I honestly still to this day feel is probably bigger. Oh god! <laughs> and this thing just, I, I caught it on the jig, so I had a lighter rod and it absolutely took off and it went straight into the anchor, wrapped me around the anchor and went to the rocks. And I had it on for probably 10 minutes before I finally gave up and broke it off. And like, I called and I had it on for so long. I like called people. I'm like, what do you think I should do right now? <laughs> like, I, I have Moby Dick on and it's stuck in the rocks and it's wrapped around my anchor and I don't know what to do. And I'm like, do I just cut the anchor now? Like I already knew the anchor wasn't coming back. And I'm like, do I just cut the anchor now and try to stem the tide and get away from it, pull it out or, and eventually I got to the point where I ended up, just getting really frustrated and I ended up breaking it off. Yeah. So, you know, at that point we knew, you know, there's no hope of getting the anchor out. We didn't have a spare with us. So 
we were sticking it out of that spot for the rest of the day. And we just, we were consistently catching, you know, short fish to like four pounds. Yeah. And I was actually on the phone with a buddy of mine talking about this big fish that I had just lost. And I hooked this fish and I'm like, Oh shit, I got a big one. I dropped my phone and it started doing the exact same thing. It shot straight up tide, went straight for the anchor. And I was like, Oh, screw this. I'm not doing it again. I thumbed the spool and I just locked up the drag and I'm like, if I'm going to break it off, I'm doing it before it gets to the anchor. And it turned it right around and I got him back, got him up. God, man, that's awesome. Do you it find was, that where it seems like big, those big fish live together or is it like you're picking up one of those here, one of those there? It, it's, that's one of the things about around here. It can be very different either. We have some spots that we fish where it's primarily big fish. Gotcha. You know, it's, you'll get a lot of eight to 12 pound fish in one small area. And then there's spots like this spot where it's primarily small fish, but if you fish it long enough, you'll get like one really good one here. Yeah. And that just happened to be the case that day. That was the spot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I bet you got that little spot fish. marked now. It's not just a spot oh, you happen to pull up over, you know, on the anchor anymore. You've got nope. that spot locked down. Absolutely. Um, how many spots in a day, if you go out and, and you're targeting TOG, like, are you, are you moving a bunch? Like, do you shut a spot down or can you, can you really sit on one spot and, and fish it, you know, pretty thoroughly? Uh, another, that's another thing that depends. Uh, the tide obviously plays a lot of factor. We get a lot of current. Um, there is absolutely spots where you can just fish all day, hammer your fish, hammer your limit, whatever you want to do. Yeah. And you never have to move. And then there's other times where, you know, especially with the charter fishing where, you know, we'll go to one spot, pick away for a little while and then wait for the tide and go hit another spot. And we try not to wipe out all the spots, you know, we'll, we'll, a lot of the smaller spots we fish, we're like, you know, we'll hit this one for a half hour, an hour. We'll move over to this one. We'll leave a few fish for the next day or whatever. Right, right, right. I think that's uh, that's important to do, man. It's really easy, especially on that, that bottom stuff. Like I see here too, uh, our flounder fishery is struggling pretty hard. We, we have three. We have summers, gulfs, and southern flounder here in North Carolina. Yeah. Um, and southerns are our, our fish that, that, that stick around. Um, and, and the near shore structure, man, they get so worked over on. Um, and well, long story short, they ended up closing down our season the past year here. You can't keep wow. any flounder. Um, and it, it's really just the Southerns that are hurting, but I went out on a guide trip. We were trying to catch bull redfish and we caught three quick and then it really died. It was a six hour trip. And so I was like, well, let's go out to the wreck here. I know we can probably catch a couple flounder. We'll have to let them go, but they didn't want to keep fish anyways. And I was like, and there a lot of times you'll, you'll pull a, a big redfish off of here. Uh, and we went out there. This was like two months after they closed down flounder season. And it was like every drop as soon as it hit the bottom just <laughs> doubled over on a flounder. Like they were eating it so hard. And it's because no one had been out there fishing for them. It just shows you if you let stuff rest and let it sit, especially if you've got your own little special numbers near shore uh, that, that you Absolutely. can go pull some fish off of, like you're going to have a lot more good fish and fun days if you if you only pick a few off of it and, and let it be. So. Do people Absolutely. catch and release tog, or are you pretty much going out there to kill all those fish? Most people are out there to kill them. Gotcha. Um, blackfish is probably the best eating fish that we have around here. Yeah. It's delicious, and man. It's a delicious. Absolutely, fish. absolutely. And uh, the past, the past few years, the, just the whole fishery has really picked up around here. More so, and more people are wanting to target them, wanting to go after them. You know, they're not. A simple fish to catch around here it's it actually takes a level of skill it's not you know take you you take out charter customers that really aren't that good and you can struggle yeah and you know it, it's you'll see like some of them are just they get it right away and other people can fish their whole lives and they just can't figure it out yeah but people want blackfish to eat and that is that is probably the one fish that everybody around here wants to kill. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it's just, it's funny, man. It's like the the way you catch fish, too, has a plays into if people want to kill them. Even if they're not tasty. Like, if you troll for them or you bottom fish for them, people think, like, people, you just throw them in the cooler. You know what I mean? But if you're, right. like, if you're casting to fish, like, that's more of, like, a catch and release fish, if you will. Which is, like, yeah. this whole weird mindset we need to get over. 
and I'm all about keeping fish, but but you know we have so many people fishing now. Like the people, if you're not going to eat the fish in a week, and I don't know about how y'all's tie fishers here, but that's what I always push here is like if you're not going to eat that fish that week, like if you've got to freeze the fish, it's one thing right. if you fish once a year, but if you're like somebody that's fishing all the time, let him go. You know, go catch another one the next day and let that one swim off and, and do its thing. But that's yeah, just exactly. my my little spiel. But um, take me through this real quick. So if you're jig fishing for them. How do you like to fish? Like, are you letting it sit on the bottom? Are you bring it up a, a foot, or or how, what do you do? Okay, directly on the bottom at okay. all times. Um, typically, if you're fishing from a boat, um, you're pretty much fishing straight down. Okay. Um, you know, if the tide breaks or the tide's weak or it's slack tide, you can get away with casting in certain scenarios. Um, you typically want to keep your sinker or jig as still as you can. Um, you know, we have some spots that the current's cranking through and your sinker or jig is going to roll. And, you know, this, we have a spring season right before they're spawning. And um, I really learned this year that the majority of my bites seemed to be as my sinker was rolling. Okay. You know, it would sit one spot and I wouldn't feel anything. And then I'd say, screw it, I'm going to lift my rod tip and start letting my sinker roll down the bank and the current, and as soon as it starts rolling, get crushed. Wow. And that seemed to play a big factor in getting those bites. Um, But typically, you're keeping it as still as you can. You know, the boat's swinging, you try not to drag it, because for one, you're gonna get snagged. And a lot of times, if you can't decipher what was a bite and a a rock rolling into it, you're you're just gonna miss it. Yeah, definitely. Um, do, do you – I'm guessing – I'm just asking this for the listeners. I, I'm assuming you hold the rod at all times when you're fishing with a jig, right? Always. Yeah, you're, not, you're not throwing it out there, sticking in a rod holder and, and waiting for that fish to bite. So your cat – People do it. People do it. <laughs> but they don't get them. Yeah, I hear that. Um, so you're tight lining the whole time. You want to have that bait you know, on the bottom with a directly tight line from your rod tip to the bait or to the jig. Absolutely. Is that the same deal if you're fishing you know, a sinker and a hook? Absolutely. So take me through your, your rig when you're not fishing a jig. Like what is your, your, not your rod and all that stuff, but as far as your sinker and your leader and your hook and all that. So I actually tied one up before. Nice. So Perfect. Just, um, basically it's a high, low rig Okay. without the high. It's just um, a low rig. <laughs> right. The low rig. That's what I call it. <laughs> nice. So, um, I, I like to keep my sinker relatively tight to my dropper loop. Okay. Um, when I'm black fishing, I prefer, and everybody does it a little bit differently, but primarily this is how roughly how it's rigged around here. Okay. Um, I snip the top part of my dropper loop and I make a bigger drop. Usually I even have it a little bit longer than this. You always want the the hook to be longer than farther past the sinker. Okay. You always want your crab to be down on the bottom. Um, you know, I've seen people where they have it snugged up top and it works, but you're not on the bottom at that point. Right. You know, your right. bait's up in space floating around. Um, so that's basically how I do it. And I snell on, I snell on my hook. Um, you know, this, this one here is a Virginia style blackfish hook, okay. uh, four out. Um, a lot of people like to use octopus hooks. Um, I even know a few people that started using circle hooks for like the customers that can't figure out when they're biting. And I personally haven't done it yet, so I don't I don't know how well it works for them. Yeah. But I'd imagine you manage to hook a couple of them. Yeah. But they, they bite the crab and crush it so fast that it just pops off your hook and you end up with no bait. Gotcha. So you gotta be able to feel that bite. Yeah. It's it to me it's I mean I the amount that I've done, it's so much like sheep's head fishing. The way we fish near shore here is like feeling that bite and if you if you feel it too late or like if you you know if you're a second too late your crab's gone and and absolutely it's it's insane how precise those fish are coming up and eating that crab real quick absolutely do 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 you see many sheep set up there when you're tog fishing y'all catch sheep's head zero zero a little too far north Yep. I guess where where do those stop for the most part? Is that around New York and New Jersey? And- uh, I think it's New Jersey. Okay, New Jersey. Um, I've I've never really heard of any come out of Long Island area or anything. Okay. Um, they they're similar to our corgis. Okay. But um, don't get nearly as big. Right on. I wish we got them. Yeah, they're cool fish. They're tasty too. <laughs> they will destroy a fillet knife though. Those big scales on them. <laughs> You, yeah, you do. You you fillet about four or five of them, and you got to go sharpen your knife again. 
Same deal, deal with the redfish. But well, dude, we're at thirty five minutes right now, and I, I I would like to talk a little bit about some. Maybe we'll just kind of touch on a few of the other you know fish that you maybe not go into the depth that we did here. Because I would like to have you back on and do like even just a striper episode sure. um, of the striper fishing in your area. But why don't you just kind of tell people what else Connecticut has to offer as far as saltwater fishing goes, and 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 then we'll we'll maybe do an episode of each one of those species um, to kind sure of branch thing. out. Um, so we have a really good striper fishery. Um, we get plenty of bluefish. The last couple of years, blue fishing has been really crappy compared to what it used to be around here. Yeah. Um, so much so that recreational, they went from the 10 fish limit to three fish this year. Wow. Um, and then the, the charter guys are allowed five. Gotcha. Um, our striper numbers, uh, they changed the regulations on them this year too. They went from anything over 28 to a slot limit. You can only keep anything 28 to 35 inches. Gotcha. Um, but we get, you know, a lot of bass and blue fishing. Um, Black sea bass, porgies, summer flounder, um, and you move offshore a little bit, you can get into sh- some sharks, tuna, um, you know, mahi, stuff like that. Right um, those are primarily what everybody around here targets. I mean, gotcha. We have other fish and stuff, but those are the main target targeted fish. Yeah. For your striper yeah. fishing, there, what what's your? Just take me through real quick how you target those fish in that area, because striper are one of those fish that everywhere they live so that you people target them differently you know they're yeah, just absolutely. such a versatile fish and you can catch absolutely. them absolutely um around here there, there's a lot of different ways you can do it around here okay. um a lot of boats troll wire line mm-hmm. um you can use what we use uh umbrella rigs okay and parachute jigs um are the primary things that we use to troll for them uh you can you can surf cast for them you can um cast eels for them you can three-way eels you can three-way bucktails um there's a lot of different ways to target them but it all depends where you are yeah um you know you can go over by shore to cast lures or you can go out into some of the bigger reefs and do it differently you can three-way porgies for bait or menhaden or three-way and eel so um, explain to me th- three-way because i've never even heard heard that a that's <laughs> and I, I kind of figured you wouldn't I, from what I gather um, it's not something that a lot of people do yeah um, it's primarily something they do around Long Island Sound okay um, when I say three-way what we do is you have a three-way swivel and then you have a dropper loop on the bottom where you put your sinker okay and then you have about a six-foot leader to your bait or your bucktail or whatever you're using on the end of it. Um, we use swim shads, like storm shads. Yeah. Um, you can three-way those. And basically the, the reason for the three-way is a lot of the times when you're using it, you're fishing fast drifts and deep water. So you got to use that weight to get it down there. Okay. And those fish are usually primarily holding tight to the structure. So you drop the three-way down and you got your sinker straight to the bottom or just off the bottom and whatever you're using for bait you keep it just off the bottom you know within six feet give or take. gotcha so that's keeping if you do snag too i'm guessing you're probably just losing your lead and you get your bait back right so typically what we do is um we'll use like 50 pound test for the sinker line okay. and then you know something a little heavier depending if there's a lot of bluefish around but typically like 80 pound test for your main line okay. um and that's exactly right because you'll pop your sinker instead of popping your whole rig yeah yeah that's perfect they yeah, retying retying the three-way rig sounds like a lot of knots so just getting rid of getting rid of the absolutely. sinker sounds like the, the way to do it absolutely <laughs> well right on well is there anything else that i didn't kind of bring up through conversation that you want to touch on with the tog fishing before we before we wrap the episode up um not really man it's i think we've got pretty much just about all of it cool. covered cool so. i i want people down here to realize how cool of a fish it is and and you know people just don't realize that you can catch them here really and i don't oh. think that you see them south of north carolina at all really maybe they see a few in south carolina but 
Um, there's a good number of them in North Carolina, especially northern North Carolina along the Outer Banks. You get up towards Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay. You're you know out there. You start right. to see a lot of those fish. Um, but but they're an incredible fish to eat, fun fish to catch. They pull hard. Like if you like sheep's head fishing down here, I mean you're gonna like tog fishing. It's pretty much very similarly done. And um, I, I've got one buddy who who's from up north who did a bunch of tog fishing. His name's Elias, and he may, he has a YouTube channel. Um, and he's the one who kind of turned me on to, oh, we can actually catch these like with, with some consistency. Um, and he, he's got it pretty dialed. But I think if people started to get into it here, we'd realize that we've got a much better fishery for them than we, than we think. Um, we just have yeah. so many crappy pinfish and baby black sea bass that fishing crabs is can be such a pain in the butt. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I can see that. <laughs> you get add a little bit warmer water and like all these – jerk fish show up and, and ruin your day but yeah. <laughs> well, well cool man well we'll definitely uh you guys will definitely bring him back on mike back on for for a striper episode i love i'd love to have like three different guys from every state that has striper to talk about them because there's just they're everyone loves them they're so fun to catch there's so many ways to catch them and every every way that people target these fish you learn so much and so many applications that you can use across the board for lots of different other species so um, right. i think it's super cool but man thank you so much for coming on and uh no look, look forward to doing another one sometime soon yeah man. sounds good and i appreciate it thanks for having me awesome well i'm gonna i'm gonna close this off here um guys thanks so much for checking out another episode of eastern current if you haven't done any black fishing any tog fishing you need to uh, if you live from North Carolina all the way up the, the East Coast, there's opportunity there for you to go go uh, try to catch some tog. But like I said, thanks for checking us out. Enjoyed doing the, the show, and we'll see you in the next episode later.